Jumping in at number five, we have Belial. Belial, whose name in Hebrew literally translates to worthless or yokeless, was canonized as the leader of the Sons of Darkness in the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you didn't know, the Dead Sea Scrolls are an ancient Jewish text discovered in 1947, which are believed to have been written before 400 BC and refer to a wide host of demonic beings. Seriously, it's spooky how much they name drop them. In these scrolls, Belial is described as both the king of evil and the prince of darkness, which has led many to believe that Belial is a pseudonym of the devil himself. Belial is also known as the lord of lies and the master of deceit. Many texts refer to Belial as a devious figure who utilizes fornication, wealth and pollution of the sanctuary to get exactly what he wants. However, in the Satanic Bible, Belial's name is suggested to translate as without a master and symbolizes independence, self-sufficiency and personal accomplishment. It begs the question, whose side is Belial really on? Coming in at number four, we have Beelzebub. Beelzebub is a Semitic deity that was worshipped in the Philistine city of Ekron. He is often linked with Satan by Christians. In demonology, he is one of the seven princes of the underworld. In Christian writings, the name Beelzebub appears as an alternate name to Satan and like I said, is commonly described as a placed higher in the underworld's hierarchy. According to occultist Johannes Wierus, Beelzebub is the chief lieutenant of Lucifer, the emperor of the underworld, and presides over the order of the fly. Now throughout history there have been confirmed reports of Beelzebub here on earth, with one of the last hailing from France. It began in the early 1600s when a young nun called Madeleine began having fits, shouting obscenities and making claims she had engaged in lewd sexual acts with demons and witches. It was ultimately decided that she was possessed by none other than Satan himself, aka Beelzebub. The possession only worsened from there, with them being forced to bring in Sebastian Michele, the local Grand Inquisitor, to aid in an exorcism. Coming in at number three, we have Payment from Hereditary. Payment is a spirit named in the Lesser Key of Solomon and is one of the kings of Kinistan, more obedient to Lucifer than most others, and has 200 legions of demons under his rule. He is said to have a great voice and roars as soon as he comes, speaking in this manner for a while until the conjurer compels him and then he answers the questions he has been asked. Payment teaches all arts, philosophy and sciences and secret things. He can reveal all mysteries of the earth, wind and water, what the mind is and everything in between. However, although what he may offer is knowledge, this does not make him good. His depiction in the Ari Aster movie Hereditary should have taught us this. He is a duplicitous demon and perhaps one of the most devastating entities found in modern horror. In Hereditary, Payment is summoned as a cult ritual by the deceased mother of Annie, played by Toni Collette, who is then forced to protect her family from Payment's persuasions. The evil demon first targets the daughter Charlie before going after the son Peter, and of course Payment invades the body. He commits unspeakable horrors that horror cinema hasn't been blessed with in a very, very long time. Coming in at number two, the Cenobites, Hellraiser. To quote the hell priest Pinhead, explorers in the furthest regions of experience, demons to some, angels to others. And that is the perfect way to describe the Cenobites from the works of Clive Barker. The Cenobites are extra dimensional beings who appear in Barker's works such as the Hellbound Heart, the Scarlet Gospels and the nine Hellraiser movies. It is said that they can only reach Earth's reality through a schism in time and space, which is opened and closed using certain unearthly artifacts, one of course being the puzzle box called the Lament Configuration. To quote Clive Barker in the Hellbound Heart, why then was he so distressed to set eyes upon them? Was it the scar? that covered every inch of their bodies, the flesh cosmetically punctured and sliced and infibulated, then dusted down with ash. Was it the smell of vanilla they brought with them, the sweetness of which did little to disguise the stench beneath? Or was it as the light grew and he scanned them more closely, he saw nothing of joy or even humanity in their maimed faces, only desperation and an appetite that made his bowels ache to be voided? The Cenobites all have horrific mutilations and or body piercings and wear fetishistic black leather that often resembles butchery garments or religious vestments. Now, aside from their grotesque physical depictions, the Cenobites are terrifyingly potent. They come from a disturbing labyrinth where sadomasochism and torture rule. Their ultimate goal is to drag the victims who open the special puzzle box back to their violent netherworld to suffer endless torture. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Pazuzu, the Exorcist. 
In ancient Mesopotamian religion, Pazuzu was the king of the demons of the wind, brother of Humbaba and son of the god Hambi. He also represented the southwestern wind, the bearer of storms and drought. Now, although Pazuzu is himself considered to be an evil spirit, he drives and frightens away other evil spirits, therefore protecting humans against plagues and misfortunes. However, don't get your hopes up because this dude is straight up evil. He was, of course, the evil spirit that possessed a young Reagan McNeil in the 1970s novel The Exorcist, as well as the subsequent movie. In the movie, Pazuzu is both named as the demon antagonist of Reagan and the unwitting helper of Father Philip Lamont, as he seeks to free Reagan from the demon's grip. It should be said that no cinematic demon has ever been more potent or terrifying than that of Pazuzu, aside from maybe the red tongue licking demon in Insidious. Not a fan of that one, not a fan at all. Now in The Exorcist, Pazuzu finds its way to the US after being discovered during an archeological dig in the Middle East. East. There it infiltrates the body of Reagan with the intention of subsuming her soul. Lovely stuff, isn't it? Pazuzu in turn makes Reagan commit some unspeakable acts, such as stabbing herself with a crucifix in areas that we won't mention here, and of course attacking her own mother, before aggressively vomiting up green pea soup. And then of course the infamous scene of Reagan spinning ahead 180 degrees. What a lovely sight. This 1973 Best Picture winner is still one of the highest grossing films ever made. However, saying that, it is best to steer clear of Pazuzu. There's no need to invoke him, especially not in the middle of the night in front of your mirror. So let's cover that thing with a sheet. Almighty Lord, word of God the Father, Jesus Christ, God the Lord of all creation, gave for your holy apostles the power to tramp underfoot serpents and scorpions. In at five, Charlie Charlie. Back in 2015, the internet was hit with a brand new challenge called Charlie Charlie, a game and internet urban legend that hit a surge of popularity, particularly amongst the teens on YouTube. Now, the history of the game is vague, but it is reported to have stemmed from a schoolyard game in the Spanish speaking world and has a long history of demonic and supernatural connotations, even being referred to as the poor man's Ouija board. The real question is who exactly is Charlie and how do you summon him? Well, Charlie is reported to be a child who committed suicide or the victim of a fatal car accident, or even a pagan Mexican deity who has dealings with the devil. Who knows? If you wish to summon Charlie, here's how. Step one, draw an X on a piece of paper. Step two, label two quadrants no and the other two yes. Step three, place two overlapping pencils on each axis, cross them in the middle. Step four, say Charlie, Charlie, are you there? And then ask a question. Step five, Charlie answers. Coming up at number four, we have Sergat. In Latin, Sergat literally translates to rise and is the physical manifestation of rebellion and opposition. His angelic opposite is Aquil. To be honest, Sergat is a minor demon and is pretty weak source compared to some of the guys on this list. But the thing that makes him pretty terrifying is his brush with a particular pope. Written between 1150 and 1227, the Grimoire of Honorius was written by Pope Honorius III with the intention of being specifically used by a priest. Pope Honorius was obsessed with the thought of Satan invading the mortal realm, and so began preparing the Catholic Church for a war. He wrote down his findings in this forgotten Grimoire, which wasn't unearthed until 1760. Honorius began his training by purposefully summoning demons, and then banishing them again in a sort of weird, spooky, demonic boxing session. It proved quite effective, and the Pope soon started to get a handle on the armies of hell. He'd write down the name of each demon he fought and leave an elaborate explanation of their strengths and weaknesses. Kind of like a Pokédex, but for demons. That is, until he came face to face with Sir Gat. All that was written in his section of the grimoire was that Sir Gat is he who opens all locks. That was the last demon that Pope Honorius noted down in his book. Makes you wonder what happened, eh? Next up at number three, we have the great Duke of Hell, Berith. Also referred to as Balberith, this guy is a pretty formidable dude. Known in the Infernal Dictionary as the Great Duke of Hell, Berith commands 26 legions of demons and is a pretty big player in the fiery depths below. According to Alistair Crowley's illustrated Goetia, those that attempt to speak with Berith soon learn that he's a formidable liar. Crowley refers to him as speaking with a clear and subtle voice, and is a liar when not answering questions. To speak with Barith, the conjurer must wear a silver ring and hold it clearly to their face in respect to the great duke. 
If not, Barith will consume the conjurer for not sincerely paying their respects. Barith is often depicted as a soldier, dressed in red clothes, riding a red horse, and wearing a golden crown. His main function is to corrupt those that crave power, and is often found lingering on both sides of a war. In 1612, a nun from en Provence was possessed by Barith. During the exorcism, Barith gave up his own name, as well as the names of all the other demons possessing her, but also the names of the saints who would be most effective in opposing them. That guy loves a good fight. Bringing up at the rear at number two, we have Pazuzu. Dating back to ancient Mesopotamia, Pazuzu is the king of the demons of the wind. He is the bearer of storms and the bringer of drought, and is often depicted with the body of a man, the head of a dog, and the talons of an eagle. In the possession case of Roland Doe, the story that inspired the exorcist, Pazuzu is the chief demon that possesses the boy. He is known to be an incredibly intelligent demon and is renowned for scheming and corrupting the pure of heart. He takes most pleasure though from corrupting the purest of the pure and is often depicted trying to possess children for sport. It is also thought that Pazuzu predates most other demons and is thought to be an obereth, an ancient evil that manifested itself from the abyss and has been tied to earth for millions of years. Strangely though, Pazuzu finds reference in a huge number of ancient societies, from Mesopotamia to Sumeria to ancient Babylon. In some, he is revered as a savior and protector, others a demon who should never be summoned. Followers of the Obereth often carve wooden statues of the demon and worship him in the hope that Pazuzu will one day reveal his true name to them. No thanks. And coming in at the top spot, number one, we have Azazel. Azazel, or Satan, or Lucifer, or the devil, or Baphomet. You know this guy. He's the king of all demonic possession, and he loves nothing more than a group of teenagers standing around a pentagram and beckoning him forward into the mortal realm. The horn prince is heavily related to the image of the goat, and we often see him depicted with hooves, horns, and a tail. But this actually has some substance to it. In Abrahamic society, a priest would whisper the prayers of a village into the ears of a goat, and then sacrifice it in the hopes that their prayers would be answers. But in fear of Azazel corrupting the goat, they select an extra goat, often referred to as a scapegoat, and use it as a decoy. They then send it out into the desert, hoping they'd wasted a little bit of time for the devil. Now, we all know that's probably not the case. He's a tricky one. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, Azazel is referred to in the Book of Giants and connects him with the story of the fallen angels. In this, he teaches men the art of war and also teaches women the art of witchcraft and painting the body. Generally, Azazel pops up in pretty much every possession story ever, and it's probably wiser just to avoid him altogether. Speak of the devil, and the devil shall appear. Coming in at number five, we have Azazel from Fallen. Azazel is a fallen angel whose evil influence led to the total corruption of humanity. Isn't that fun? Due to being the leader among the fallen angels, the Jewish Book of Enoch commands its readers to ascribe all sin to him. His description has varied throughout history, with him originally being one of heaven's angels, a gloriously beautiful man with wings on his back. However, when he was cast down to earth and became fallen, his beauty became corrupted, in turn taking on a demonic appearance. Once cast down to earth, he became a leader of the Grigori, a group of angels who married more to women and produced a line of monstrous children. He then began teaching evil to humans, teaching mankind of warfare and the art of deception, before finally teaching us about witchcraft. Now, Azazel has had a big screen appearance in the 1998 crime drama Fallen, which follows homicide detective John Hobbs, who witnesses the execution of serial killer Edgar Reese. However, soon after the execution, the killings begin happening again. In the movie, Azazel evilly outwits Denzel Washington's character, with it being revealed that Azazel's true power is being able to jump from host to host with a passing touch. In at four, Suji Ura. Also known as the Forest Game, this legend originated many years back in Japan. There is little on its history, but the game has become popular across many Japanese teens. Here's how it goes. Find a comb and something to cover your face, head to a crossroad when it's dark, and then run the comb over your teeth three times in order to make noise. After that, chant Suji Uro, Suji Uro. Grant me a true response, three times. Now, if a stranger approaches, be sure to cover your face. This is a demon. You have to ask 
ask them to tell your fortune. However, if they refuse, leave it at that. Demons should not be pushed. In at 3, one person hide and seek. Also known as one man tag, this game is a ritual for contacting the dead and demons, spirits wandering between realms searching for a host to reside in. In the game you will offer up a host in order to summon one of these spirits. Side note, on the wiki page for the game it has a warning. If you have psychic abilities you may feel unwell or be prone to accidents during the ritual. You have been warned. So how do you summon the demon exactly? Well, here are some things you need. One stuffed doll, rice, enough to fill the doll. One needle, one crimson thread, one pair of nail clippers, one sharp edge tool, one cup of salt water, a bathroom with a bathtub, and a hiding place. Now from there you must remove the stuffing from inside the doll and then fill it with rice. After that is done you must clip your nails and put them inside of the doll as well. Then sew up the opening with the crimson thread. When finished, tie up the doll with the leftover thread. Following this you need to go to your bathroom and fill up the tub before returning to your hiding place where you must put a cup of water on the ground. Now it's important that you give a name to your doll because at 3am you'll have to repeat that name to the doll 3 times before putting it in the bathtub. Turn off all the lights in your house, return to your hiding place and then turn on the TV. Now count to 10 with your eyes closed. After that return to the bathtub with the sharp tool and repeat to your doll I have found you and then stab the doll with the sharp tool. Then say you are the next it and then say your doll's name. Take the doll out of the bath, leave it on the counter and then run to your hiding place as soon as you can. Then hide. The demon is after you now. Now our last three numbers are centered around popular games from the last few years that made a surge online with teenagers but we must also remember that it is possible to summon demons without the help of a game. Classic satanic worship has found success through black magic and witchcraft. Also human sacrifice. So now I'm going to list off the two demons you should definitely not try to summon because the repercussions will be horrifying. In at 2, Renove. Now, Renove is a teacher and the demon who wrote how to win friends and influence people. Now, that is bad enough, but what makes this demon worse is that he is the taker of old souls. Whomever he inhabits, he instructs them about rhetoric and the art of insinuating themselves into other people's good graces, according to Gizmodo. However, if you are old, Renove will take you and there is no coming back, not even pets are safe. He will slay anyone that is deemed too old in his eyes. And finally, in the number one, Beelzebub. We say the best of the worst for last of course, the prince of demons himself, Beelzebub. History states that in the 1600s a young nun, Madeline, became possessed, having fits and shouting obscenities. She also began making lewd claims that she had been engaging in sexual acts with demons and witches. After some research it was deemed that she was in fact possessed by the devil. The attacks began to spread through the nunnery, with other women coming forward. A grand inquisitor was brought in to help drive out the devil, but it didn't work. However, a shocking revelation came about. The girls accused their priest of inciting her, and that he was in fact aligned with the devil and he was a worshipper of witchcraft. He was even accused of engaging in sexual acts with the woman. The priest was eventually burned at the stake after he told those who questioned him that he would give his soul to the devil, Beelzebub. The moral of the story, don't get possessed by Beelzebub. 